grace. 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 So uh, turn, if you will, to Nehemiah the chapter 6, which is the new one. We left off in chapter 5 last week. And uh, here it starts off by saying, When Sambalat, Tobiah, and Gersh, uh, um, Gisham, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and no breach remained in it, even though up to that time I had not uh, positioned doors in the gates, Sambalat and Gisham sent word to me, saying, Come on, let's set up a time to meet together at um, Kephirim in the plain of Ono. Now, they intended to do me harm, so I sent messengers to them, saying, I'm not engage I am engaging in an important work, and I'm unable to come down. Why should the work come to a halt when, uh, halt when I leave, leave it to come down to talk to you? They contacted me four times in this way, and I responded the same way each time. Now, that right there, again, is just another example of the kind of man that we're dealing with. The enemy will always try to derail you. He'll try to intimidate you. He'll try to get you in fear. Anything to get you off of the course God has placed you on. And uh, sometimes it's done through means of subversion. Sometimes it's done through tactics of intimidation. Sometimes it's done in order to generate, and intimidation is similar, similar to this, but sometimes it's through genuine threat of fear and, and, and mortal danger. Other times it's, it's a lot more sly, and we're also going to confront that tonight as well. Uh, the enemy will often come to you with comforts and encouragements uh, if you are not currently in the middle of God's will to keep you from getting there. Uh, so, you know, uh, we have to be aware. We have got to keep our eyes on the whole, the precious Spirit of God, who is the only one who's got uh, a, a, a global view of what's going on. He knows not only all that's going on on the earth and in our life, but he also knows the plan of God, and he knows how to marry the two together in a way that only God can. Remember, as we were reading um, at the towards the end of this last year in First Corinthians chapter two, it says, "For no, who man, what what can what man can know the things of a man except for the spirit of man that is in him." Even so, no one can know the thoughts of God except for the Spirit of God. But we have not received the Spirit who is of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So, you know, God gives us foresight. He gives us understanding. And it can only come from him because he's the only one that's got that perspective, right? The only one that's got a complete perspective is God. All of ours is fragmentary at best, Right. Even when God does speak into our world, even when God does give us clarity, it's only partial clarity. Not, sometimes that's by design. Sometimes it's just because of the limitations of our human flesh, because the veil that still remains over our eyes to some degree or another is the flesh. Now, the veil that obscures God entirely was taken away in Christ. Right. But there's still we're still looking through a glass dimly. We're still be, and that's because of the flesh. One day when this flesh has been removed from me, I'm going to see face to face. I'm going to know even as I am known. But until that day, I'm looking through a veil, right? And I thank God I can still make out his face, right? Thank God, even though it's maybe slightly translucent, I can see that image on the other side. And what I see is enough to drive me uh, with, with deep respect and awe and reverence and longing to get into the fullness of that presence once and for all in you know, at the end of my life, I long for that, right? Don't you? But at the same, so even though what we have is obscured, it's enough to, to bait us to realize what's truly on the other side and clarity is beyond anything we could ever imagine. Amen. And so that draws us. But I just, I, I want to point out to you that the enemy is always <coughs> going to try to derail you in some way or another. That's, that's his whole, and, 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 and don't be so, so uh, um, focused on yourself to think that you're the reason. Because the enemy really doesn't give a flip about you. None of us are that important. None of us are. Not, uh, there's not a human being other than Jesus who's ever been on this planet that was not fully replaceable. Completely. If God had not found an Abraham, he'd found someone else. 
Don't you remember when we were in the book of Esther? If you won't be used, God will find someone else, Esther. Thank God she allowed her heart to be used. Amen? Thank you, God, for such a godly woman. But, you know, she could have said no. And would that have been the end of God's plan? No, he'd have found someone else. Jesus was the only irreplaceable, right? <laughs> Amen? And thank God he never had to be replaced. So uh, so don't think, of, think that it's because it's all about you, but it's because of what God wants to do. Because God has placed his love upon you. And because of that, that makes you val a valuable target to the enemy. It's not because of who you are. It's because of whose you are. It's because of the love of God that's been placed upon you. That makes you a target. Amen? It's not because the devil is... The devil's... Uh, you have to realize the devil's not so stupid as to think that if he takes you out, he's going to completely sidestep God's plan. He knows better. He's been around long enough to realize God will find someone else. But he, but if he takes you out, he can wound God's heart. Amen? I'm reminded of the song from Michael Card uh, called... And I forget the name of the, 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 the song. But it... Um, uh, oh, fancy. The, the name of the song was Why? And in the song, it's, it's asking a whole bunch of questions. Uh, you know, like, why did they nail uh, Jesus to the cross? His love would have held him there and all the various things. It's a beautiful song. But one of the things that uh, that says it, said was, why did uh, why did it take... Something, I forget the wording exactly, but the idea was, why did, was it a friend who chose to betray the Lord? And said, because only a friend comes close enough to ever cause so much pain. So you, when the devil attacks you and I, it wounds the heart of God because you are in his heart. Amen? He loves you. And so to hurt us is to hurt him. That's the reason why Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus and said, why are you wounding me? Right? I mean, the Christians were being put up in persecution and were being rallied into prisons and, and brought before, you know, emperors to have them executed and God's heart is breaking. Right? So, you know, realize that that's the reason why you're a target. Amen? But, but, and realize that every one of us are called to high destiny. It doesn't matter what you are or who you are in the body of Christ. Again, we've said it so many times, but, you know, I think it always bears repeating because the enemy's lies still are there badgering you in the back of the head, lowering your significance in the kingdom of God. There isn't an insignificant child in God's kingdom. There is, and, and not only that, there's not a child of God who's more significant than another. Hello? There isn't. Those are all earthly designations. The janitor, as I've said before, looks at themselves and they think, I'm less than the President of the United States. No, they're not. No, they're not. They have partaken of flesh and blood. They all are image bearers of God. What did James say? He says, you know, he says, you, know, you guys, you really need to watch your tongues. Because, you know, with it, we bless our God and Father. And with it, we curse men who were made in his likeness. Brethren, these things should never happen. You should never curse another human being because that human being, to curse them is to curse the very image of God, whether that person's born again or not. They're image bearers. They might be image bearers in rebellion, but they still bear his image, his likeness on some level, right? And he says, these things should never happen. And so, you know, the enemy's always breathing these lies in us, but realize that if you are a child of God, you've been born to high destiny. If nothing else, if you did nothing else in your life but live for God in such a way that Christ is being formed in you, you are being made into a habitation that God will live in forever. You don't get higher destiny than that. Hello? Amen? So none of us lack significance. That is is a blatant lie of the enemy, a distortion of both God's face and the extenuation of his face, which is us. So don't buy that. So, you know, now I don't even know why I went off on that, but, you know, uh, take it for what it is. And, and those words are true. Nonetheless, uh, they have a fleeting a, a, um, a, uh, something to do with what we're looking at here and that Nehemiah was clearly, he's one of the more obvious ones, was called of God and had um, high purpose in his life, did he not? And the enemy was doing what he could to derail him. And uh, so four times these, uh, these, uh, this, uh, uh, um, 
uh, I forget the guy's name, is, Tobiah, reached out and tried to uh, derail uh, Nehemiah with four different letters. And four and those four different times, each time he responded to him the exact same way. Don't allow the enemy's intimidation to make you sway. He didn't bother rewriting a letter and saying it a different way. He said the exact same thing all four times. He was not going to let him uh, take any more of his time than necessary. Amen? The, the Bible doesn't say to walk unaware of the enemy, but he also says, you know, don't let him foil, foil you and, and, and spoil you by his devices. Don't get caught up in him. Be more caught up in The Bible is all about you turning your back to the enemy and turning your face towards God. Now, in order for me to turn my back to the enemy, I have to recognize he's there. God's not saying live unaware that he exists, but only live in a way that a way, a way in which you know that he exists long enough for you to know relative to the devil, where do I place my back? Because he doesn't he doesn't deserve, and he certainly cannot command any of my attention because I have a new Lord. Amen. He he does not he does not deserve a moment's time. <clears throat> I said he doesn't deserve a moment's time, a moment's consideration. 99.9% .9 of the time, I don't even turn around to tell the devil to leave me alone. I ignore him as if he's not even there. Because from, for me and my purposes, he really isn't. What do I care if he's here? He's got nothing to say to me and I've got nothing to say to him. Amen. We parted company way back and I ain't picking it back up again. Right, so I'm not even. I'm not even gonna uh, dignify his 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 speaking to me with a response. So Nehemiah, he says the same thing all four times. Verse uh, verse five says the fifth time, uh, um, Sanblat sent his his assistance to me in this way. Uh, he had an open a letter in his hand. Written in it were the following words: Among the nations, it is rumored, and Geshem has substantiated this, that you and the Jews have intentions to, uh, of revolting, and for this reason you are building the wall. Furthermore, according to these rumors, you are going to become their king. You have also established prophets um, to announce in Jerusalem on your behalf. We have a king in Judah, and now the king is going to hear about these rumors, so come on, let's talk about this. So he, he tries to put himself out there as his, as his friend. Hey, I've heard, I've heard that, you know, the gig's up. I know what you're doing. And you're building up this wall to protect you against uh, King Artaxerxes. And, uh, and you know, and, and you've, you've lined up prophets to, to say, you put words in prophets' mouth to tell all of Judah that you are God, the king that God is establishing. And, uh, and let me tell you, this is going to end badly for you. Why don't you come over here, buddy, and I'll put my arm around you. Let's talk about this and let me talk some sense back in you before this is, ends badly for you. Of course, this is all a lie. He's not concerned in the slightest bit for Nehemiah. And he knew that these rumors were not true. Now, he said, I sent word back to him. We are not engaging in these activities as you are describing. All of this is a figment of your imagination. Verse 9. All of, this, uh, all of them were wanting to scare us, supposing their hands will grow slack from the work and it won't get done. So now, strengthen my hands. This is Nehemiah praying to God. Then, when I, went, then I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, uh, the son of Mehatabel, he was confer he confined to his home. He said, let's set up a time to meet in the house of God within the temple. Let's close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. It will surely be at night that they will come to kill you. But I replied, a man like me, should a man like me run away? Would someone like me flee to the temple in order to save his life? I will not go. Now, again, it's all coming from different angles, isn't he? If this plan doesn't work, let's try something else. If this plan doesn't work, we'll try something else. Different angles. He says, I recognize the fact that God had not sent him, for he had spoken the prophecy against me as a hired agent of Tobiah and Sambalat. He had been hired to scare me off, uh, scare me so that I would not, so that I would do this and thereby sin. They, uh, uh, they would thus bring reproach on me and I would be discredited. If you can't make the man stop his work, make his voice so that no one will listen to him by discrediting him. 
right? Now, this sin spoken of here may have had something to do with cowardice, though I'm not certain that cowardice was understood as a sin under the Old Covenant in situations like this. I think more than likely the sin would have been where he would have been retreating to since the tabernacle courtyard would not have been a secure location. So this was most likely in reference to the tabernacle of meeting, a place that Nehemiah was not allowed to go because he wasn't a priest. If he'd gone into the temple, he would have been breaking the law. Hello? Because, you know, obviously, uh, the, the intention of this person was to go to a place that was secure. Well, the courtyard, the temple, isn't secured by doors. However, the temple was. Not the old one in the wilderness. That only had a, uh, had a, a curtain. But the new one, if you go back and you read what Solomon had built, it had a door on it. A physical door, right? And uh, now, the only the only exception I can give to this is that even that really wouldn't have been that secure because the door was made out of cypress and olive wood. So it's not like it couldn't have been busted down. But nonetheless, it would have been the most secure place he probably could have gone or retreated to. So I think that probably what would have made it sin was not so much the retreat, though that would have been sin to Nehemiah personally because it would have been an, uh, an exhibiting of a lack of trust in God. But secondarily, and secondarily, it would have been a sign of a lack of faith in the leader who the people were following that God has set Nehemiah up as being. But thirdly, I think, and most importantly, it would have been retreating to a temple that he didn't belong in, right? Because he wasn't a priest. Verse 14, it says, Remember, O my God, Tobiah and Sambalat, in light of these actions of theirs. Um, also, uh, Noadiah, the prophetess, and the other prophets who were trying to scare me. So the wall was completed on the 25th day of Elul in just 52 days. Now, again, look at that wall. That is a heck of a wall, guys. That that would have been, that. I'm telling you, that would be a feat in today's day to build a wall that huge in 52 days. Exactly. I mean, uh, if you've ever seen any of these plazas we have pop up all over the place, they're, they're six months in the making, at least, right? Uh, uh, this is this huge wall, which encompasses an entire city and a huge temple, and, and it was ridiculously tall and had many towers in it. This is not a simple construction for anybody. This is a big, big wall. These are, and, and you need to understand, these aren't like one cinder block thick. This is wide enough that you could have three or four or five people side by side walking down across the top of it. So these were big walls. Okay, so quite the task, right? And thus, it says what it says here. It says, when all of our enemies heard and all of the nations um, who were around us saw this, they were greatly disheartened and they knew that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. The people around them knew this is not something a human being or a group of human beings could ever have done. That's just not possible, Right? In those days, the aristocrats of Judah repeatedly sent letters to Tobiah, um, and, and responses from Tobiah were, were repeatedly coming back to them. For many in Judah had sworn allegiance to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara. Um, his son, Jonathan, had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. They were telling me about his good deeds and then taking back to him the things I said. Tobiah, on the other hand, sent letters in order to scare me. Now, this reveals a diet divided people. These aristocrats or nobles were of Judah, and so were presumably the exact same nobles we just got done reading about last week, who had been extorting the people of uh, the Israelites, by taking the slavery and taking their lands and, and, um, and exacting uh, um, interest out of loans that they had given them. And the cry of the people risen up to Nehemiah. And Nehemiah um, um, approached the aristocrats or the nobles and said, Stop this. These are your brothers and sisters. We should never do this kind of thing, right? Especially during a time of, of national distress, right? So, 
it, it's almost uh, almost a certainty that these are the same people. And these same people just in, in, in the last chapter expressed remorse and gave back the lands to the people and actually gave them some of their money back and, 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 uh, and, and so on. And so there, there was obviously something in them that was good, and yet they still were in the back pocket of this other guy. So there's a problem here, isn't there, right? Uh, this was, um, all that was done that I just told you was uh, dealt with in, in chapter 5. Th there was a connection between these people and an eminent person who worked with Nehemiah on the wall, namely Berechiah, the last guy brought up in that verse, okay? Now, Tobiah was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, who himself was a son of Ara. According to Ezra, the house of Ara had come up with Zerubbabel from the captivity. Tobiah's son Jonathan, Tobiah, the guy who's causing a lot of this problem right now, his son Jonathan was the husband of Berechiah's granddaughter. Berechiah worked with Nehemiah on the wall. So there's a close connection here. Hello, are you following? Okay, so Tobiah had a continual stream of insider information being sent to him and means of corresponding with them. His intel was lacking, though, since he clearly did not grasp the character and motivation behind Nehemiah's actions, uh, that he was a man of integrity who was devoted to God and loved God's people. If he had known that and been fully convinced of it, he would never even tried to dissuade him. Now, in Nehemiah chapter 7, starting in verse 1, it says, When the wall had been rebuilt, and I had positioned the doors, and the gatekeepers, and the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, I then put in charge, uh, put in charge over Jerusalem my brother Hanani, and Hananiah, the chief of the citadel. For he was a faithful man who feared God more than many did. So that also tells us something about Nehemiah. Also says something about his family, right? Who did he put over it? His brother and Hananiah, the chief of the citadel. And the reason why he chose him is because he was a faithful man who feared God more than most. That tells me where Nehemiah's priorities were. It's not because he was wealthy. It wasn't because he was um, particularly smart. It wasn't because of the fact that he had strategies that were better than the next guy. It was because of the fact that his priorities were straight in regard to God. That's why he placed him where he placed him. Verse 3 says, I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem must not be opened in the early morning until those who are standing guard close to the doors and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, until those who are standing guard close to the doors and lock them. Position residents of Jerusalem as guards, some of their uh, guard stations and some near their homes. Now the city was spread out and large and there were not a lot of people in it. At that time, houses had not yet been rebuilt. Verse 5, My God placed it on my heart to gather the leaders, the officials, and the ordinary people so that they could be enrolled on the basis of genealogy. I found the ge genealogical records of those who had formerly returned. Here is what I found written in that record. These are the people of the provinces whom... Returned from the captivity of the exiles, whom King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had forced into exile. These returned to Jerusalem and to Judah, each to his own city. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, uh, Ramiah, uh, Nehemani, Mordecai, not the same Mordecai we read with Esther, a different Mordecai, uh, Belshan, uh, Mispereth, Bigviah, uh, Nahum, and Banna, the number of the Israelites, uh, Israelite men, were as follows. Now, the list here is the exact same list we read in Ezra 2. Okay? Uh, so precise are these two lists between one another that I'm giving myself, not to mention you all, a break from me having to read it aloud. Um, thank you, God. And there was much rejoicing. Um, I talked to Terry last night and I said, oh, she was there as I was reading through this as we were going to sleep last night. I'm reading through these chapters just to have them mulling over my heart. And I got to this chapter like, oh my gosh, I have to read all these names all over again. And uh, and uh, Terry said, well, you know, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? I said, I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to, I, what I want to do is I want to make it a, 
uh, a free-for-all night of reading so that I point to each person and say, now you read these verses and you read these verses and let you guys take the names for a change. But uh, as I was going through it today, I realized, you know, this is the exact same list I've already read, so I'm giving myself a pass. Now, not, I do want to point out a few things, though. <laughs> it's not to say that there are not a few differences between these two lists. And there are explanations for them, and there's, but they're too numerous to cover. But I believe the most plausible is that the list of Ezra was compiled while he was still in Babylon and was composed of those people who intended to go. And you can see that in the wording of Ezra chapter 2, verse 1. It says, these are the people of the province, uh, province who were going up, not who had arrived. Is that be with me? Do you see that? It's important that you see it. Yes. Okay, these are the people of the provinces who were going up from the captives of the exile whom King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had forced into exile in Babylon. Whereas the wording in Nehemiah 6, 7 is these are the people of the provinces who returned. Are you with me? So it's very possible that when Ezra was, because remember that the decree had sent out from Artaxerxes giving them a right to return during Ezra's day. Right? That was the third decree that we read about, the fourth one being the one given to Nehemiah that was prophesied through Gabriel to Daniel. Nehemiah was come back and rebuild the city. That was the prophecy given to Daniel through Gabriel. But the first three were about restoring the temple, right? Ezra was given the very last command that was from King Artaxerxes, the same King Artaxerxes who 13 some odd years later gave a command to Nehemiah to go back and deal with the wall, had 13 years previously told Ezra to go back and rebuild the temple or finish the rebuilding of the temple. So while he was there, he had also given permission to as many people in Babylon whose homes, whose native homes were in that region, could return back to their homeland and participate in the work, okay? And it's very likely that those names who said, oh, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go, Ezra wrote those names down, okay? Or somebody did for Ezra. However... By the time that it took, uh, by the time they actually made the journey to come down there, undoubtedly some people changed their minds. Some decided to come that had not been part of the original list, and some decided not to come who were part of the original list. Is that, are you with me? So Ezra's was probably a list of those who had signed up to go. That's okay. Ezra's was probably a list of those who had decided to go, and Nehemiah's was a list of those who actually went. Okay? The, it's a very small discrepancy, but there is one, okay? The, now, another thing that I think is important here is that you have to realize, that, let's use, uh, just to illustrate the purposes here, I'm going to make Ezra, um, uh, um, uh, Stephen, temporarily, he's Ezra, and I'm Nehemiah, okay? So he's, on the, he's, he's compiling a list of all the people who are going to go with him down to Jerusalem, right? And he does so. 13 some odd years later, I'm sent down with a different mission, but he's still alive in the same city. His job is finished, and I'm starting mine to rebuild the wall. And after the wall is complete, the Lord lays it upon my heart to do the same thing he put on his heart to do. And take a number of all these people and to make sure that the people that came down with me can be united with the families who had come down with him. And they all go to their ancestral houses, because remember, it says inside the city, there weren't a lot of people because the houses had been, re been rebuilt yet. So it would, God laid upon my heart, Nehemiah, to correlate the two lists and, and, and cooperate with them with the people who came down with me so that all the people can go to their same original homes and build their houses from their families, you know, their four or five families' um, name, right? The estates that they had come from. And now, do you not think that because Stephen's still alive, Ezra's still alive when God tells me to do this, that I obviously know that there's a genealogical record, and so I go get his. Now, do you not think that in my comparing the two and seeing a difference, I might go to him and say, hey, why is there a difference? Wouldn't that make sense? Right? And if there was a bad reason for a difference, then I might make note of now, as I made my list, I noticed that Ezra had made a few mistakes. 
And these are the corrections. You think maybe? But he didn't do that. So I'm guessing that either it was obvious that the reason was different because he took his names in Babylon and I took mine after already having arrived, therefore there was a difference. Or there's some other reason for it that's not being mentioned, but that at the day made no difference whatsoever. The point is that it can't represent, logically it makes no sense, it would represent a problem with scripture in itself. Because number one, these weren't scripture at the time, these were just records, okay? But records, records were important. If they weren't, weren't important, why would you attach specific numbers to specific households and make a record of it? So if there's a discrepancy, and that discrepancy represented an actual error, it would be recorded as such, and an amendment being made. Because you need to understand, when Nehemiah was writing this, he wasn't thinking, now, this is going to be in the Bible, so I better make sure that I correct these things in such a way so it doesn't look like there's a discrepancy here. No. These were just written records, and they were supposed to be what they were. Are you following? And so there must have been a logical reason for it that wasn't a problem. Because they had the chance to talk with one another and corroborate their lists. Is everybody with me? So I, I, so as far as I'm concerned, it's not an issue. And the lists are ridiculously close. The names of the households and the order in which they appear are almost absolutely identical. All right? But there are some discrepancies. There are minor ones. There's also a discrepancy when you get to the very end. And that is... Um, uh, well, I, I, want to, I want to address two other things real quickly before I get to the, the thing at the, the end. I also want to mention, mention this thing right here, and that is that the one thing that, uh, that, uh, that I find fantastic is uh, the greater issue, I think, is that such a list of names exists twice in the Bible. That I find to be compelling. You know, as I told you when we were in Ezra, these names represented only about 2% of the Jewish people who had been given the right to return back to Jerusalem. Because they had settled in the land and made homes and did the best they could to make the, mo the most out of a bad situation, they became satisfied and content where they were. And this was sinful. I said this was sinful. Now, many of you might immediately, if you're paying attention, find that at odds with something that I just taught you two weeks ago on Sunday and the passage in Hebrews I quoted, which told us under the, who, under the New Covenant to be content with such things as we currently have. That's what these people did. And that's why they didn't go to Jerusalem, because they were content. I don't need to go to Jerusalem. I'm content where I am. And yet Hebrews tells us to do that. But in them doing it, it was sin. Why? Well, if you remember... In Hebrews 13, 5, which is the passage that says, be content with such things as you have, it's referring to our contentment in Christ. That we are not to seek contentment in the world, or in the things of the world, or the things that we own, but in Christ alone. In effect, this is the same reason it was wrong for the Israelites of Ezra's and Nehemiah's time to be content in Babylon. Their entire focus was upon their comfort and their convenience. What's comfortable and convenient for me? In Babylon, they had already had homes. They already had a family. They already had a means of living. To uproot from this and return to their family homesteads in Jerusalem, which lay in ruins, was to upend and unsettle their comfortable little lives. Yet God had given that land to them by promise. And in his mercy, he was allowing them to return again, and they chose to stay in enemy territory because it was comfortable and convenient. Hello? How often can we say that about our own lives? Because what lays in front of us is our promised land of Jesus being formed in me, and how often do I not allow that to happen because I'm comfortable and content where I am? What did we just read? What did we just sing in that beautiful song that woman just sang to us in, in prayer and uh, praise? He says, you know, that um, I forget the exact wording. Some of you might remember it. But uh, essentially, don't, I don't want to be content where I am. I want to press deeper into God. Amen? I don't want to be content where I am. Amen? I, I like the way the Amplified says it. Um, and and it, says, it doesn't use the word content. But uh, um, when it talks about, he said, I want that um, we need to be uh, satisfied with a dissatisfied satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs>
it's, it's very good wording. That, like, I think they amplified Houston, that particular verse. I can't even tell you what the verse is at the top of my head. But the point is that it, I think it emulates what, we, what we're dealing with. We need to be satisfied where we are with Christ, but we need to be satisfied with a dissatisfied type of satisfaction. A, a, a type of satisfaction that drives us to get deeper into Christ and not settle where we are. Amen? That's the kind of satisfied that we are. Now, let me encourage you with the fact that the enemy, again, will always seek to make things easier and more comfortable for you just outside of God's will for your life. You know, if you buy the enemy, the American lie that it is a human right to exist for the pursuit of one's own prosperity, dreams, and happiness, you are going to be easy prey for the enemy. Easy prey. Because it's a lie. The men and women who returned nearly all did so out of a sense of pride in the land that God had given to their forefathers, out of a sense of respect to the patriarchs of their faith, and out of a sense of honor for their God, not because it was comfortable or convenient. It was not easy. It wasn't comfortable. It wasn't even safe. Remember, they asked for letters to be given them by King Artaxerxes so that as they were traveling down there, they wouldn't be mugged and killed. Right? So it wasn't even safe to do this. But it didn't keep these people from doing it, from honoring God and their forefathers. This made their actions righteous. And God has said that the memorial of the righteous is blessed. So God saw to it that their names show up twice in Scripture. <clears throat> twice it's not enough that I record these people once I want them showing up two times you need to really understand that according to the Hebrew language the way that the Hebrew language especially back then worked and this is especially true in poetry though it's true in other ways as well it was a cultural thing as well that was broader than the context of just poetry where if something was said twice it gave it great significance if it was said three times it meant you need to do everything shy of stabbing yourself to stay awake and pay attention to this because this is of life-threatening importance if it's said but three times but twice is huge it was an it turned a statement into an exclamation right with huge amounts of exclamation points and bold and underline okay that's what saying it twice did so by the Holy Spirit, by inspiration, having these names listed two times in Scripture was the Holy Spirit honoring these people and making sure the memorial, the memory of them would be blessed. Amen? So now, um, so these people's names have been recorded in Scripture two times. Now, I'm going to skip down to verse 70 because I'm not going to read them. But I think that what I have said is significant enough. I think it's important that, that we, we, we looked at that and considered those things. But in, in, in verse 70, that's where there's another different type of discrepancy. Um, it, it, there's a difference, and there's also a clear difference in the people that are mentioned. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it to you, and then I'm going to uh, tell you what it is. Verse 70 says, Some of the family leaders contributed to the work. The governor contributed to the treasury 1,000 gold drachmas, 50 bowls, and 530 priestly garments, which is considerably more than Ezra mentions. Some of the family leaders gave to the project treasury 20,000 gold drachmas and 2,200 silver minas. What the rest of the people gave amounted to 20,000 gold drachmas, 2,000 silver minas, and 67 priestly garments. This, these lists do not correlate with Ezra. They do somewhat, but not entirely. The difference is, uh, particularly, I think, in the people being mentioned. In Ezra, it does not mention the gift that was given by the governor, but only the heads of the families, while Nehemiah mentions the governors and some of the common people. So I think the people being addressed are different, okay? And that uh, alone would throw the numbers off, okay? But even still, there are differences, and I think it's, it's worth being noted that the differences are, in fact, there. And I'm not trying to sidestep them. I'm, in fact, the one pointing them out to you, okay? So there is differences in the list. I think there's good reasons for them, but uh, and I don't understand all of them. I'm just telling you what I do know, okay? That having been said, I'm, I'm going to see what I can't spend some more time with it this next week because this latter part, more than the former part, the latter part of the gold and the provisions kind of bothers me a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit because, again, the names being given are different. And so, therefore, I would expect there to be a difference. But based on the difference that I'm seeing, I would actually expect Nehemiah's outcome to be larger 
than Ezra's, but Ezra's is larger than Nehemiah's, and that's what bothers me a little bit. So I need to spend some time with that, and hopefully I'll have a greater answer for you next week. If I don't, I don't, but I'm going to try, all right? So with that being said, let's move on to chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1. This is the chapter we're ending with tonight because I don't want to start in chapter 9. There's a lot here in chapter 8. It says, All the people gathered together in the plaza, which is in front of the water gate. They asked Ezra the scribe, same guy, right? The guy who came before me. He's still there. Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which included men and women and all those able to understand what they heard. Now, I'm going to say something here. You remember when I talked to you about when we went through the book of Ezra, I told you that Ezra was uh, to Nehemiah, or I'm sorry, that Nehemiah was to Ezra what the Levites were to the priests, okay? The Levites were like a support role to the priests. They weren't priests, but they supported their work, right? They were direct, in fact, they were sectioned off for that very purpose, Ezra had gone into this city to rebuild the temple, which was the center of God's people's worship. Amen? And so his job was more spiritual in nature, wasn't it? He, and you recognize when we went back through the, when we went through the book of Ezra, you could see there was a spiritual revival that took place in the hearts of the people, which paved the way for Nehemiah to come and do some of the things that he did. In fact, I submit to you that I doubt that the, the nobles of Judah would have responded like they did quickly in giving back the land to their brethren and, and to give them back money that had been extorted from them and so on had a general temperature of spiritual enlightenment and spiritual reform had not already been going on because of the work of Ezra before Nehemiah showed up. I think it was because of the work of Ezra that it, may, it paid the way for Nehemiah, much like the work of John the Baptist paid the way for Christ, right? God has a way of doing this, right? And I think that happened. Uh, and, and so it's because of that, that and you can see it here, because Nehemiah is not the one that goes up and reads the scroll. Because he's really, he's the natural leader, not the spiritual leader. Ezra's the spiritual leader. So I was just doing that just to compare, because I would said that early on in Nehemiah. And here you see pay dirt for that statement. Because Nehemiah is now kind of sitting back. Though he's, he's up there with them. He's not really participating in the teaching and the reading. Because he's not a priest. He's, led, he's deferring to the one whose job it belongs to. Right? And he's the spirit, and the person who was a spiritual leader was Ezra. Okay, so uh, enough said on that. So it says, So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which included men and women and the, all those able to understand what they heard. In other words, this was anybody who was probably at least able to understand the Hebrew language and understand to some degree abstract concepts. Okay? That made the list pretty young. It would have probably excluded some people who were in grade school and certainly um, infants. But infants would have been there with their moms. They just wouldn't have been necessarily understanding what was said. So this is the great majority of all of Israel uh, that showed up, that was there. Uh, that the 2% that was there was were assembled. I just I think that's important that you understand. It just backs some of the things I've said many times at this church that this is why, uh, and it's it's another reason why it's not probably the primary reason, but it is a good reason why we probably don't get a lot of people at this church because I'm not going to back the idea of having children entertained in another room while their parents are being um, uh, worshiping and learning in in the next room. I think parents and children ought to be learning together. That's the way I was raised. That's the way these people were being treated. Now, does that mean that I would not support having a children's Sunday school? I have no problem with that. In fact, I would love that. That would be great. But that would not. That would be an addition to, not a supplement for them coming into the main worship service and sitting down quietly with their parents and learning. And parents don't want that today. What they want is their child to be entertained and taken care of and free me to enjoy myself in the main worship. I don't want my child in there. And we are not going to provide that. Not now, not ever. I said not now and not ever. We're not doing it. Okay? Because I think that, it, because I don't think I would be a good shepherd. Because a shepherd leads, not only by example, but they leads us, at lead, they're, they're people 
where they need to go and illustrate how they do their life by how they do church. Right? How they worship in the assembly should also be mirrored in their homes. Right? That's the reason why in the home of God, in the house of God, there's male leadership. Because in the natural homes, there's male leadership. The one exemplifies and sets an example for the other. Are you following? That's also why husbands ought to be paying attention to how um, leaders in a church do what they do because they lead by way of example and they're servant leaders. They don't, they don't, in a home, you don't set up as, as the grand poobah and command everybody to run around circles around you while you sit back and do nothing. That's not the way a husband's supposed to be. They follow the example that they see in the leadership of the church. Are you following? They serve. Amen? So, I mean, this is the way it should be. But also, it's important that a child learn along. I'm telling you what, one of the reasons why, and Terry brought it up the other day, one of the reasons why we see the perpetual pattern over and over and over of first-generation encounters with God, where people have a move of God, and, 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 and the people who are part of that experience they, they're on fire for God and they live passionate lives for him. And then their children, they continue to carry the torch, but they really don't know where the torch came from. And they're really not sure what the torch represents. And they really haven't experienced this themselves, but they know it's important because mom and dad did it. And mom and dad weren't dumb people. So this must be important, though I really can't tell you why. And then when they have kids, their kids are like, you were just doing what your parents said. This has never really meant anything to you. I'm going to go do my own thing because I'm not that stupid. And so you have the third generation just goes off and goes pagan. And their children who grow up with parents that were pagan are like, life has got to have more to it than this. And they begin to seek God and that generation has an encounter with God. The cycle starts all over again. How do you keep that from becoming a cycle? Don't separate your children when you worship. <clears throat> That child needs to see a father with tears streaming down his face with his hands raised towards heaven and he's, him hitting his knees and, and repenting over sin in his life and not hiding that from the eyes of his children. They need to be able to see parents, a mother and a father who love God with devotion. Amen? Who interact with their friends and when they talk with their friends, what they talk about is the Lord, not the latest movie. <coughs> Not that the latest movie is necessarily bad, what well, probably is if it's latest, but you know what I mean. You know, uh, uh, not being so preoccupied with garbage and the affairs of this life, but occupied with the things of God. Amen? They need to be present and see that. Because what did God command? You raise your children as you're walking through the way. Don't leave your child at home. Every day for a Jew was bring your child to work day. <laughs> The children learn by way of example. They live with their father, their parents. Now, now, was there a time when the, the, the boys were still at home with their mom? Of course. There was a time where in their infancy, they still the, the, the boys and the girls were being raised by their mother. Amen? But there came a point, a transference, when the young man was now, it's important that he now be in training to become a young man. Right? And so now he begins to, maybe it might have been seven or eight or nine or ten, but at some point he started going to work with his dad. And it was kind of like an apprenticeship. And at some point, there was a day of ascension where that young man was declared a man. The woman, the young girl was learning how to be a mother and be a keeper of the home and be a teacher of the children at home herself by the best teacher she could ever get and as the example of her own mother who herself learned from her mother who herself learned from her mother. Best example you could get, right? This is the way it was done. And you can see how we've broken that up. So much so that in our nation, the whole idea of pursuing your own dreams requires you to leave the home of your parents, establish a new one, and the only time you really visit them is on the holidays. They cease to be an ongoing example for you. Most families don't even worship together anymore. When they break free from the home, they establish their own independent family unit separate from them and very likely worshiping in a different location. No wonder God has got a task on his hands just trying to get any generation interested enough to have an encounter with him. Whereas if they had been brought up in the place where they had seen it lived out in front of them, there'd be a difference. Again, I can't help but bring up, can you hold on to that, Doris? Um, I'm not ignoring you. Um, uh, I, I can't help but go back to that the, the example I see all the time playing in this house um, of the Waltons. When you, The more I spent time watching that show, 
these people really, most of them, didn't know God. They really didn't. I mean, the, the mother and the grandma might have. Um, the rest of them, you can see when they're going to church, they only did it because mom told us we had to, you know. And when they wrestled through whether God exists and whether the Bible is true and blah, 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 they weren't really sure. But one thing's for certain, my parents support it, so I'm going to. So they really, really weren't behind it themselves. But the one thing you would see is that both in the father and the mother, they emulated morals. And because of that, the children did as well. It wasn't just what their parents did. When they did something wrong, you can see it nod at them until they brought it to the light in front of their parents. And they said, this is what I did. And the parents would correct them and usually didn't require more than a verbal rebuke because the kid felt so bad about it themselves. These are people that weren't even born again. And their conscience was doing more to correct their behavior because of the influence of their parents than Christians' children are. Why? It's not because one morality is higher than the other. I think it's because there was an ongoing example that was lived in front of them. Hello? And the parents weren't silent. I mean, the dad in the Weltons never said a lot, but when he said something, it was important. And he never failed to speak into his children's life in important issues. He was there. He was present. Oh, if Christians would just do the same thing. We'd have multi-generational people who've had encounters with God. Amen? I was just listening the other yesterday, uh, and I can't listen really to music as I'm doing my bicycle thing, because if I listen to music, my, my pedaling will go up and speed up or slow down based on what I'm hearing. I'll find myself keeping tempo. So I can't do that. So I listen to teaching, which I would really rather do anyway. And I was listening to um, a guy, I think his name's O'Neill. I forget what his name, full name is. Great teacher. Uh, really great teacher. Way before his time. Uh, in the 70s, I think it was. And uh, he was talking about... Uh, uh, cheap grace and how in his day, how, you know, he was noticing a huge difference between the impact that the church was having and the impact the church was having just a generation or two before him. And he said, and he said, and I'm, I've am i had to sit there and weigh it out because I don't understand it. He said, at first I didn't understand because when you look at it, he says, right now, Christendom and the Bible is, enjoy, is enjoying more um, acceptance and more publicity than in the history of the world. The Bible is being is being placed out there as a rule book that people should seriously consider. You could tell pagans, well, it's what the good book says, and and they're like, well, you know, I can't argue with that. Pagans, pagans didn't open up their stores on Sunday because that Bible that I don't believe in and don't follow says don't do it. Are you following me? Right? And he said, you know, and now, now there are more gospel singers. There's more recording artists that are singers. There's more TV shows that support uh, Christian values. There are more uh, evangelical stations than we have ever had since the history of the world. And yet the world feels more free to sin in front of church, uh, churches and in front of Christians being unaffected by their influence than ever before. What's changed? It's not because they're hearing the word less. They're hearing it more. It's on billboards, for goodness sake, back in his day. Why, through overexposure, are they getting even worse? And they are not compelled and, and, and convicted in their heart that what these Christians are doing is right. It was because what the Christians were doing wasn't right. They were living a lot like the world. And one of the reasons is because they hadn't had the encounter their parents had had. And so the influence and the impact that we were having on society stopped. Oh, we were singing more and we were they heard us more, but they were becoming irritated more because they were hearing all these words and lives weren't being lived. And now we're just a mockery. And I'm telling you, Jesus is not coming back for a church that's a mockery. So where, how does it change? What changes in me? Each one of us individual pointing at our own hearts, Right? It changes with me, right? I can't, I can't change what everybody else does, but I can change me, right? So, so I begin to live it. I begin to have passion towards God, amen? I begin to live this way. And it'll rub off on people around me, and you'll rub off on me, and, and a fire will begin, amen? But it has to start somewhere. 
So we make the discernment determination rather than bemoaning what we see. Change what you see in your own mirror, right? This is what I'm going to do, right? So it says, Ezra the priest, all that from verse 2, sorry about that. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not sorry. But um, so Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly. Oh, I'm sorry, I am sorry, because I didn't get back to you, Doris. I'm sorry, what were you going to say? Well, just briefly, it's what came to my mind was where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And what do they think the treasure? Do they treasure having your children separated from them just so they can be you know, free kids for a while? Mm-hmm. Or do you treasure the fact that they need to be brought up hearing what God has to say to their hearts as well as what they're having to say to their parents? That's right. And, and, and I, you know, I, I don't want to demonize the parents too much, and I'm the one that kind of would set that pace, but um, because a lot well, of the parents do this. Scope, yes. Well, yeah, there is a broader scope, but I think that a lot of the parents do this because they feel inadequate to teach their children. They're like, I'd be better off sending them to that Sunday school teacher uh, and let them do their thing while I'm doing my thing. I'll just try to get whatever I can from the pastor, and maybe they'll get something from their teacher. That's probably their reasoning. But what you don't, and what they may not even recognize, is that they're giving themselves a back door because God called them to be their parent, their children's teacher. So you get into that book and you find out the answers and then you emulate it to your children and you bring them into the worship service with you expecting they're going to ask you questions that you don't have answers for. And don't be afraid of that, but tell them, you know what, Junior? I wish I knew that. That's a really good question. You know what we're going to do? Uh, you know, at breakfast tomorrow morning, we're going to spend time with that passage that the pastor brought up. And we're going to start working through that this week before we go to school and just read those passages and we'll talk about and discuss it. And that's the Holy Spirit to enlighten us because we need to know and answer that. That's a good question. See what I'm saying? But we want to sidestep that responsibility, you know, and I, that's just an unhealthy thing. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which included men and women and all those able to understand what they heard. This happened on the first day of the seventh month. So he, he heard it before, he, I'm sorry, he read it before the plaza in front of the water gate from dawn till noon before the men and women and those children who could understand. All the people were eager to hear the book of the law. Boy, what a difference. Ezra the scribe stood on a towering wooden platform constructed for this purpose. Standing near him on his right were uh, Matith- Mattathiah, Shema, um, Ananiah, Ana- Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah. On his left were um, Pedaiah, no, no, sorry, yeah, Pedaiah, I think it is, um, Me- uh, Michelle, Melchizedek, um, Hashum, Hashbadadana, um, Zechariah and uh, Meshulam. Ezra opened the book in plain view of all the people, for he was elevated above the people, and when he opened the book, all the people stood up. And it's a practice that I like that they do over there at Alistair Begg's church, or at least they used to do. Whenever he will read the key text for that Sunday, everybody stands. He reads that, and then he prays, and then he sit down and he starts this message. I like that. I've not implemented that in here because uh, one of the things that I have wanted to implement in here is a more family feel and less of a former feel. But the Lord might lead us to do that just to shock us a little bit and make it, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm not saying that the Lord has told me that, but if he does tell me to do it, we'll, we'll do it. But I like this because it shows respect for the words of God, right? It says, he opened the book and all the people stood up. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people replied, Amen, Amen, as they lifted their hands. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. I, th- I know for a fact that the body of Christ acted that way on Sundays before they heard the word of God taught, or even in their own homes before they read the word of God, it would have a profoundly different impact on us. Because this isn't really so much with what they did in their physical body, it's the fact that their physical body was doing what was in their heart. It's a heart issue. How are they treating the word of God? Is there deep and abiding reverence for it and a sense of worship and a sense of adoration that God has graced us and blessed us with the ability to hear it? Amen? These people had grown hungry because for years they had not heard these words. Amen? It says uh, Joshua, Bani, um, uh, uh, Sherebiah, Jamin, uh, Akab, Shabethiah, Hodiah, 
Messiah, uh, Kalida, Azariah, Jozabad, Hanan, and Palaia, uh, or Palaia, I'm sorry, Palaia, all of whom were Levites, were teaching the people the law as the people remained standing. They read from the book of God's law, explaining it and imparting insight. Thus the people gained understanding from what was read. Now, I, this is another thing I'm just going to throw in here on top of what I've already said. There's a kickback today. And I, I know some of these people personally. There's a huge kickback today from having leaders in churches. There ought to be, it all ought to be community-led. And whoever needs to, feels the need to speak needs to speak, whether it's a man or a woman, and they come up and they teach and they do this and they do that. And there shouldn't be any one person who's standing up on a sta stage behind a lector because that's putting man in an elevated position and they're becoming an idol. And yet here you have Ezra up on a very high platform so that with the intention that everybody can see him. Right? Now, granted, let me go ahead and add one thing to this. Undoubtedly, that was also so the voice would project. And today we have mics, you know. Um, and, and do I and am I personally against the idea of putting any one person in the position of being an idol? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, to be perfectly honest, if our church were to grow larger, if I could get away with it, I would love to have verses on a screen in front of everybody and me be behind everybody as I'm teaching. Just, just to keep away from anybody putting one person, myself or whoever happens to be teaching on a pedestal, because we don't belong on one. You know, it's, like, it's not about the person. It's about what's being said. Amen? At the same time, he is their spiritual leader. Are you feeling what I'm saying? So there, it's a balancing act. Are you seeing what I'm saying? I, I think there's a position and a way in which that should be honored, but at the same time, not in a position like we do stars and celebrities. That's ridiculous. That would be idolatry. Are you following me? So, you know, this is another reason why there are some churches who do this, by the way, and I love it. Because more than the pastor, people have a tendency to idolize the praise and worship group. And there's some churches that literally have the praise and worship group behind and the words projected on the top so that there isn't this stardom and the spotlight and all the colored lights and everybody looking at these artists and these who are becoming celebrities of their own. And they just side up that whole history because this needs to be about the Lord, especially when we're dealing with worship, right? I like that. I really like that. If we ever got to the point where we had live worship, I probably wouldn't force that. Because you know, I just think it's silliness. I mean, and if it weren't for the practicality of me being in the front or, or whoever's teaching me in the front, I would say do away with that too. Because I, I don't, there's no point. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it, there might be some point, but sometimes I think what is detracted is more than what is gained by doing it. So enough on said on that. But I'm just saying that today, in our today's world, there's a huge kickback from pastors being behind pulpits and sitting on an elevated stage because that is putting them in a position of idolatry. And, and we reject that whole idea. That's one of the reasons we just don't even go to church anymore. Well, you know, I, I would say to them they need to read the book of Isaiah and just shut up and just go with a better heart. You know, if that pastor is doing what he's doing for the wrong reason, then let that be between that pastor and God. You go... And, and receive with a right heart. Amen? But don't use that as a reason not to go. That's just an excuse. And it's a lame one at that. Right? Okay, so enough said all about that. It says, um, they were reading from the book of God's law, explaining it, and imparting insight. That's the reason why there were so many up there. Ezra was the dude, one reading it, but the other priests were explaining it to the people. So as they were reading it, they were explaining it. Right? So there's teach, there was reading and teaching going on all at one time. When they read from the book of God's law, explaining it and imparting the insight, thus the people gained understanding from what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priestly scribe, and the Levites, who were imparting understanding to the people, said to all of them, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had begun weeping when they heard the words of the law. Now, I got to tell you, that's not the response you would see of the average person today if you're reading the Old Testament. People are not going to sit there and weep with their hearts convicted. 
Yeah, this is was the response of these people. He said to them, verse 10, Go and eat delicacies and drink sweet drinks and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, as I've often told you, this appears to be God's joy, not man's joy. So often we take this as saying, the, the, when we read the joy of the Lord is your strength, it means the joy that you experience about God is your strength. And I don't think that that's what the words are saying. I think they're saying God's joy will give you strength. God's, they clearly didn't have joy. They were mourning. That's why he said, change what you're doing. You're sad. God's happy right now. Why do you think, well, someone, someone tell me, why do you think God was happy at the mourning of his people? My first thought is because they came back to where he had promised them to begin with, that he took, you know, rather than staying in captivity. Okay, that's one thing. Yeah. Uh huh. That's one thing. What else? Why were these people mourning? And why would that morning make God happy? Joyful, even. And their hearts were being broken out of their disloyalty to him. They heard these words, they're like, oh my gosh. I didn't realize that some of the things I've been doing was such an affront to God. They hadn't heard this. This is the first time they'd heard the word in their lifetime. And their hearts are broken. That's the appropriate response. No wonder God had us sing today a broken spirit and a contrite heart. You will not despise. Amen? <laughs> you desire truth in the inward parts. What was happening to these people? Their hearts were changing. Truth was being birthed in their hearts and their hearts were broken because they had not been living these things and they knew what they had done to their own God. And it broke their heart. And God's like, I love you. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. That's the right response. Right? You know? And so they're mourning God skipping around the throne room. Not because they're sad per se, but, but because of the reason behind they were sad. Because their hearts were broken because of their disloyalty to God. And they didn't want to be disloyal to God. They wanted to honor him and respect him. That's what made him rejoice. Amen? And that's why the priest said, stop your mourning. God's dancing right now. So you dance. Have a mirrored response to the way God's heart is acting. Amen? Because God's joy will be your strength. Now, you were saying, you're going to say something? No, you, you just covered it, so it's okay. Oh, okay, okay. I didn't want to, I, I never want to cut, cut people off. But so, you know, so, and like I say, I, I've often told you, this is, this is God's joy, not man's joy. Their sorrow of heart was understandable. And it was healthy, and it was good. You know, and now James tells us the same thing under the New Covenant. He says, you know, um, to, to saints under the New Covenant. He says it's an appropriate response to mourn and weep when, you, when our sins are exposed to us and our treasonous deeds are expo exposed to us. However, James goes on to say that when we do humble our hearts before God, he will lift them up, right? These Israelites were humbling themselves and honoring God. Their hearts were broken both over their past willing and ignorant sins of disloyalty to God. However, since this day was a day of feasting and a day of God's delight in the heart, uh, the, the heart response of his people, he commanded them to, re to share in his joy and so experience a new strength that will not only eclipse their immediate sorrow, but also allow them to revel in their connection with God and his pleasure in them. And this also was going to offer strength for living their daily lives in a way that will honor God. Now, I was interested to find that the Expositor's Bible uh, the, uh, made a comment very similar to this. And I did not know that they had done that. So I just in, literally found that out today. I'm going to read it to you. It says, By the expression, the joy of the Lord, it seems clear that Nehemiah and his associates uh, meant a joy which may be experienced by men the, um, through their fellowship with God. The phrase could be used for the gladness of God himself. As we speak of the righteousness of God or the love of God, so we might speak of his joy in reference to his own infinite life and consciousness. But in the case before us, 
The drift of the passage directs our thoughts to the moods and feelings of men. The Jews are giving way to grief, and they are rebuked for doing so, and encouraged to rejoice. In this situation, some thoughts favorable to joy on their part are naturally suitable. Accordingly, accordingly, they are called to enter into a pure and lofty gladness in which they are assured they will find their strength. This joy of the Lord, then, is the joy that springs up in our hearts by means of our relationship to God. It is our God-given gladness. In other words, it originates in the heart of God and then is bestowed upon us as we enter into his heart. Okay? It says it is God's given gladness and it is found in communion with him. Nevertheless, the other joy of the Lord is not to be left out of account when we think of the gladness which comes to us from God. For the highest joy is possible is um, uh, to us. I'm sorry, for for the highest joy is possible to us just because it is first experienced by God Himself. There could be no joy in communion with a remote divinity. The service of Molech must have been a terror, a perfect agony to his most loyal devotees. The feelings of a worshiper will always be reflections from what he thinks he perceives in the countenance of his God. They will be gloomy if the God is a somber personage, and cheerful if he is a glad being. Now the revelation of God in the Bible is the unveiling of I'm sorry, is the unveiling with growing clearness of a countenance of unspeakable joy and beauty and gladness. He is made known to us as the blessed God, the happy God. Then the joy of his children is the overflow of his own deep gladness streaming down to them. This is the joy in the presence of angels, which spring from the great, the great heart of God, makes the happiness of returning, penit uh, returning penitence so that they share in their father's delight, as the prodigal shares in the home festivities when the fatted calf is killed. In other words, what he's, what he's saying here in a little bit older English terms, that the angels rejoice when a, a sinner returns back to God, right? And the reason they rejoice is because they can see the joy of God in the face of God, in the actions of God, and they vicariously experience that same joy because it's how God's heart responds to a penitent sinner returning. You see? And this is the same way this passage is talking about with us. It says, This same communion of gladness is seen in the life of our Lord, not only during those early sunny days in Galilee, when his ministry opened under a cloudless sky, but even more amid the darkness of the last hours at Jerusalem. For, <clears throat> in his final discourse, Jesus prayed that his joy might be in his disciples in order that their joy might be finally made full. Right? Now, I also like an observation that Guzik makes here, and um, that and that is that obedience is always in our grasp, and our emotions are always well within our control. Let me read that to you again, or say that to you again. Guzik makes an observation that obedience is always in our grasp, but never it's no, never beyond you. And that our emotions are always in our control. Always. You don't have an excuse for emotions running amok with you. You don't. They are always within the ability of your own control. Such thoughts run diametrically opposed to modern thinking. In today's world, we believe our emotions are always valid and that they are, are they, that they are, um, and they are, and, Oh, I'm sorry. This is what I'm sorry. That our emotions are always valid and that they are um, not inside of our control. They always dictate to us and we only do ourselves harm when we try to suppress them. While there are in fact times when suppressing your emotions would be harmful in the long run, there are many more times when it is not only appropriate, it is also right to do so. An example that springs immediately to mind is found in Ezekiel, who was told not even to mourn for his own wife when she died. And he didn't. Now, and you're gonna I'm gonna read it to you. This was not because he wasn't his wife wasn't dear to him, because the verse says 
She's your very heart, but do not mourn for her. And he didn't. That's control. If you don't have that control, you need to learn to get it. Because if your emotions dictate your behavior, that means you have a Lord other than Jesus. That might not be easy to hear, but it's the truth. Ezekiel 24, verse 15 through 18 says, The Lord's message came to me. Son of man, realize that I'm about to take the very delight of your eyes away from you with a jolt. But you must not mourn or weep or shed any tears. Groan to mourn for the dead, but do not perform mourning rites. Bind on your turban and put on your sandals on your feet. Do not cover up your lip and do not eat food brought by others. In other words, don't participate in all the things that are attributed to mourning. So I spoke to the people in the morning and my wife, uh, and my wife died in the evening. In that morning, I acted just as I was commanded. And that's not the only example. We saw that in the, in the Old Testament, didn't we? Uh, in other places, when we're going through Ezekiel, uh, I'm sorry, not Ezekiel, but in, um, in um, Exodus and in uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy, in Leviticus. Remember, there was one time when the priests were not allowed to uh, mourn at all, even though the loss was, was, was felt most by them, and all of Israel had to mourn on their behalf, but they were not allowed to shed a tear. They had control. These people are people who weren't even born again, and they had control. Does that show how far the apple has fallen from the tree with modern Christians? We can't control ourselves. We have almost zero control over ourselves. And the Bible says no, that should just shouldn't be. Here's what Guzik actually said. He said the people felt sad because they were aware of their own sin, but they could uh, but they could walk in joy because God was doing a great work. Our emotions are not beyond our control. We can do God's will even when we do not feel like it. Now we're going to pick up in verse 11 to finish up the rest of this chapter. It says then the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not grieve. So all the people departed to eat and drink and to share their food with others and enjoy tremendous joy, for they had gained insight into the matters that had been made known to them. On the second day of the month, the family leaders went with Ezra, the scribe, together with all the people, the priests, and the Levites to consider the words of the law. They discovered written in the law that, there, that the Lord had commanded through Moses that the Israelites should live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month, seventh month, and that they should make a proclamation and disseminate this message to all their cities and in Jerusalem. In other words, these people didn't know about the Feast of Booths. Booths. They didn't know that they were supposed to, because remember, God had made it an ordinance that uh, when you guys go, in, when you guys come into the land, now, God told them this as they were still wandering in the wilderness. He said, but when you come into the land and settle in homes and stuff like that, I want you to celebrate a thing called the, the, um, the Festival of Booths where you get out of your house and you live in a tent. And it's to remind you of the day that I brought you out of Egypt and led you through the desert when you had to dwell in tents. Right? Okay? And they couldn't celebrate that until they had an option because while they're in the wilderness, they only had tents, right? It was only once they came into the promised land they could do this, all right? And they had, these people had been in bondage and captivity in Babylon. They'd never even heard about this. So this is the first they'd ever heard of it, right? It says, go out to the hill congre... I'm uh, um, sorry. Yeah, um... Uh, Da, 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 da. They discovered right in the uh, verse, uh, verse 15, and they that they, they should uh, make a proclamation to disseminate this message in all the their cities and in Jerusalem. Go to the hill country and bring back olive branches and branches of wild olive trees, myrtle trees, date palms, and other leafy trees to construct temporary shelters, just as it is written. So the people went out and brought these things back and constructed temporary shelters for themselves, each on his roof and in his courtyard and in the courtyards of the temple of God and in the plaza um, of the water gate, and in the plaza of the Ephraim gate. So all the assembly, which had returned from the exile, constructed temporary shelters and lived in them. The Israelites had not done so from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day.
Is that unbelievable or what? That is astounding. From the day that they entered into the land of Canaan until uh, while Joshua was alive, Ashua, after Joshua died and the first judge took place, until this day, it had never been celebrated. That's a lot of days, guys. That is a lot of days. That includes during the days of David. During the days of Josiah, Hezekiah, good guys, good men. Who loved the Lord. But this was not observed. So you, can you see what kind of momentous day this was? God had finally captured the heart of his people. And God would rather have 2% who were de get dedicated than 100% that weren't. Right? It says, everyone experienced very great joy. Ezra read the book of the law of God day by day, from the first day to the last. They observed the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, they held an assembly, uh, they held an assembly as was required. That's where we're ending. We'll pick up in chapter nine next week. But hopefully, you got a lot out of this, because there's a lot there. Um, uh, I think that, you know, uh, number one, realizing that, you know, the enemy's going to try to derail you either by intimidating you, or try to derail you by trying to keep you comfortable where you are so that you don't go where God wants you, right? Not do what he wants you to do. And that our response should always be to honor God and keep keep our eyes on him, not be dissuaded. Because the guy that came to Nehemiah and told him to go into the temple was putting himself out there as a prophet, and he was um, a son of a priest. So Nehemiah would have external reason to assume that this guy was led by God. And yet he didn't hear him because of the fact that he knew in his heart that this guy was not speaking on behalf of the Lord. He was being led, wasn't he? Not by externals, but by the inward voice. Amen? Even under the old covenant, right? And then we learned that, you know, how important it is to honor God's word and to show deference to it, show respect to it, and how we ought to always have those people within the sphere of our influence, especially our children, in immediate proximity to us with, as we're worshiping, especially in the formative years, right? That they might learn by way of example, amen? And that, you know, we have control over our emotions. That when God calls on us to act in a certain way that is appropriate, and we must not say that's beyond me. Is that with me? Those are good lessons to learn. Would you agree with me? So does anybody else have anything to add to that before we close tonight? I, I just picture him rejoicing because when we come to him, you know, when we leave our, our fleshly life and come to him, the joy that he expresses or has at that point is just immense. And so we get stronger by, like I say, by yeah. in his joy. Into it. Yes. Flooded. Amen. The joy of the Lord. That's right. Because he said if we, our, our desire is to please and to do and to honor him and to become more like Jesus. Amen. So therefore, you know, the joy increases. I can't imagine him sitting up there saying, well done. But you got it. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And it's just so important that we connect more with God than with our own natural circumstances. Right? A, a real quick thing, too. Mm -hmm. So many people nowadays have what they refer to as the celebration of life mm -hmm. when people you know pass, pass away uh -huh. wherever and so we, we've seen that they're celebrating the life because they want to be with they, they've got to be with the Lord yeah. but yet even at that people still you know, be tearful and sad and yes and that, that there's times when that's appropriate I mean even Jesus wept when um, John the Baptist was beheaded and so on I think that they're I do think that there is a point at which grief should end in the heart of a believer. Yes. Um, that does it, Grief is different than sorrow. I can remember an event that damaged me deeply when it happened. And upon the remembrance, it might bring a tear, but I'm not back there with the same weight of grief I had when it happened. That's appropriate. That's human. There's nothing wrong with that. But to live, for a child of God to live with devastating grief, that is a sin. And I will not apologize for that because it's the truth. To live with crippling guilt, uh, and, I mean guilt, but um, well, guilt too, but to live with cr uh, crippling um, uh, grief for a child of God is to place an event or a person in a place higher than the Lord. These bad testimonies, bad news. Of course it does. Really 
Absolutely. There, there is a time. There is a time for grief. But for a child of God, it should not be it should not be anywhere near what the world says. I mean, even the New Testament says we don't grieve as the world grieves, right? Um, so even in our grief, it's not as deep as the world's because um, and, and when we're talking about the, the intended purpose and the intended people Paul was referring to in that were people that we knew were born again. Obviously, if a person was lost, that is going to be devastating to us to know that. But even at that, there comes a point where you've got to let it go because you can't change it. It is what it is. And this person chose Regardless of how dear they were to you, they chose to spit in the face of your Savior. How much grief should you really show that? You know what I mean? Well, I'm sorry. Well, that was my mom. That was my dad. That was my grandfather. That was my daughter. That was my son. Yeah. And whoever loves them more than is not worthy then. You know what Jesus said, right? So I mean, are these hard sayings? Sure, they're hard sayings. And does it mean that we can't show some sorrow? No, it does not mean that. But it can't be ongoing crippling grief. You know what I'm saying? And when when something devastating happens, it's appropriate. In fact, if you don't grieve, you're probably going to eventually grieve. You know what I'm saying? It's gonna if you pin it up and you don't give vent to it, it's going to come back on you. And in those cases, to choose not to grieve, you can hurt yourself. You know what I'm saying? By not giving vent to it, if they like at the at the, at the death of a loved one or something like that, if you never give vent to that, then it could. If the Lord commands you not to, well, then He's giving you grace for that. But in most cases, it's important and in fact healthy to show to give vent to some grief. Amen. Without question, if you pin that up and don't allow that to happen, it will crop up probably in health issues later, and you'll eventually wind up. You know that 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 debt will be extracted.